Hi, Algebra 2 students. We are starting a new unit. So unit three is all about linear functions. So that's why you get the cute little, you know, line graph going on there. And we are going to be doing some graphing in this unit. But I just wanted to really quickly look at what's coming for this unit. So as you're looking at it here, um, we start with something called average rate of change. And we'll do a little example with that in a moment. Uh, different forms of a line. One you should recognize, one might be new. Modeling linear functions and so on. That's going to take us over two days. Uh, we're skipping day five, so you're going to notice we only go from day four to day six because we've already talked about inverse functions. But don't be surprised to see these pop back up here. Then we get to do some piecewise, three by three systems. These are fun. And then word problems with those, review and test. All right, so that is what's coming for this unit. Jumping right on into today. Talking about average rate of change, I like this first example just because it's actually really interesting to look at this data over the years. This is the history of the general hourly minimum wage in New York State. So different states, you know, maybe different rules, but New York State, so what you guys are familiar with in particular, right? So when you look at it, it's giving you the date and then what is the minimum amount people could be paid here? So starting back in 1960, it was established that a dollar an hour, that's what you're looking at. All right, and then it works its way through. It changes a couple times in the 60s, but not by much, you know, a buck 15, a buck 25, and so on, right? Um, 1978, that's just a touch after I was born right there. It changes from 230 to 265. When I was a kid, so my first job was like 1996-ish, um, it was at a rate of 4.25, but my first job I made five dollars an hour. I felt very fancy. All right, the chart stops in 2017. So I was looking. I just looked up, and in 2019 it changed again, and it is now up to 11.80 an hour, which. It's pretty awesome if you're a kid making minimum wage, not as awesome if you're an adult making minimum wage. So just kind of depends. All right. So when it says how much was the minimum wage all right, in those particular years? So you're just looking at the chart and reading it. So 1960, it was a whopping $1 an hour. When I was born, all right, it went from 1978, 230 to 265. So let's use the second one. So it changes up to 265. Um, 1991 was another jump there. So 425, All right, And then 2017, the last one officially on the chart, minimum wage is up to 1040. And you guys can see, so you might've gotten a job in the last year or two, or maybe you don't have a job yet. But look how it's changed over that chunk of years from 2013, 14, 15, it kept on moving, which is pretty cool. Um, so when it says, how much did it change from 1960 to 1978? Well, I just want to know, like, how much did the value increase? So from a buck to 65, went up by $1.65. From 1978 to 1991, the difference here, and you could subtract on your calculator if need be, comes out to be $1.60. <clears throat> and then from 91 to 2017, there's a big increase there. So $6.15. Mm-hmm. And so when it says calculate the average rate of change for each time interval, all right? When we say average rate of change, so literally on average, um, how much money changed, but you have to consider, right? How much did it change over the given amount of time? So what we just found right here is how much it went up. It went up a buck sixty-five. It went up a buck sixty. It went up six fifteen. But it didn't happen necessarily in like one year time increments or even equivalent time increments, like 10 years, 10 years, 10 years or something. So when you look, when you have to consider the average rate of change for each time interval, you have to consider how much time has gone by. So you have to figure out the change in the money. So a buck 65, but that changed from 1960 to 1978. So that was over 18 years. Mm -hmm. So over 18 years on average, how much did it increase? Well, if we take that quotient, a buck 65 divided by 18 years, it went up about nine cents a year. Big money right there, all right? And then same thing for the next one. Um, from 1978 to 1991, it went up a dollar 60. But from 78 to 91, that was a 13 year 
gap. So it didn't go up quite as much as this, but it went up faster because it was only in 13 years. So if you take a buck 16 divide, it comes out to be about 12 cents per year. So it's a little bit of a faster rate of change. And then the last one, $6.15 increase is definitely the biggest increase here, but over how much time? So 91 to 2017, right? That's 26 years right there. So it's the biggest change, but also the biggest amount of time. But if we take 615 and divide it by that 26 years, it's still going to be the biggest, whoops, move it this way, the biggest rate. It's about 24 cents a year. So almost an extra quarter per year, right? So when I ask you for the biggest rate, rate has to be a comparison. So in this case, it's the amount of money per time, then the biggest rate of change here would be this one, right? But what this should kind of seem similar to when you're comparing, you know, the rate that one thing changes to the rate that the other thing changes, that is actually something that when we graph that is representing the slope. Now, when we think about slope, right, we think about change in Y over change in X, which is that little delta right there. Um, you might have learned it as rise over run. But if you think about it in this regard, I'm going to come back up to my chart for a second. Time is always the independent, the X value. And then Y is whatever is depending on that. So it was how much the money changed over how much time had gone by. The change in Y over the change in X. So when we were asked for the average rate of change of the minimum wage, it was essentially asking you for the slope of this data. Now, if we were to graph this, it's not perfectly linear. What we would start to see is we would see that, you know, it increases and it increases a little bit more and then you see a steeper increase. So the steepest slope matches the biggest rate of change here. Right? Our focus here is on average rate of change. All right. So what we just said there a second ago, the average rate of change is how fast a function changes on average over a certain domain. So over a certain domain is pretty important because if it's linear, then it's going to be the same rate of change. But otherwise, if it's not a linear function, you're going to see it kind of change throughout. Right. So there's a couple ways you can write this one way. Oops, I'm sorry, guys. I'm a little crooked here. Let me slide up. One way is to think of it as slope. And so in terms of slope, we say change in Y over change in X, which essentially means Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus x1. You will sometimes see it, and this is kind of like a pre calcy way to show it, is to say for an interval where x goes from a to b, so imagine those are like the little endpoints of a particular line, then what we would say is that the change in f of x, so our function, over the change in x would be given by how much the y values change from a to b. So we write that as f of b minus f of a, and then all over the change in the x's, well, b minus a. These two things mean exactly the same, because anytime we use f of x or f of anything, those are y values. And then in this case, b and a, we're setting those as x values. So what I want to do is just some practice questions. So I'm going to say calculate the average rate of change over the given intervals. All right, so the first one, I'm gonna give you the function f of x equals five x plus seven. And then the domain that I'm gonna give you is from negative two less than or equal to x, less than or equal to three. Right. Now, if we were in class, I would give you a few minutes to try this one on your own because we're flipping and watching a video. We're gonna, the, I think the easiest thing to do is to quick calculate um, 
f of negative 2 and f of 3 first, and then we'll go from there. So just kind of off to the side here. You can do a little mental math. You could grab your calculator. I don't care which way you do it. But the idea of 5 times negative 2 and then plus 7, right, that's going to give us negative three, because it'd be negative 10 plus seven. If we do F of three, plug in a three, so five times three would be 15 plus seven, that's gonna give us 22. So to calculate the average rate of change, we would do F of three minus F of negative two, and then all over three minus negative two. Now, the order in which you do them doesn't really matter. So you could have done f of 2 minus f of 3. Just in the denominator, make sure that it matches. Right? So if I take my values, I got 22 minus negative 3 all over 3 minus negative 2. Both cases, we go plus a positive, plus a positive. So this will give us 25 over 5, and we come out with 5. This should not be surprising, because when you think about it, if average rate of change is synonymous with the slope, and this is a linear function, there's the slope right there, all right? So it's the same as the slope. So any linear function I give you, if I ask you for the rate of change, you can just tell me like, hey, I don't even need to show the calculation no matter what the domain is, it is just whatever the slope is. So if for the second example, if I said, you know, f of x and then equals negative one half x minus two, whatever domain I could possibly give you from here to, you know, wherever, it wouldn't matter at all. You, your answer would be that the average rate of change would always be equal to that slope right there. So it'd just be negative one over two, right? Now, if it's a non-linear function, so you have to be able to recognize when it's not linear. So something like x being squared, or if you have an exponential or something like that thrown in. So let's do x squared plus one. That one does not fit that basic old, you know, uh, y equals mx plus b format. So in this case, you'd actually have to calculate it because you can't just look at the slope value. So if I say three is less than x is less than five, let's use that little chunk for our domain, right? Same thing. You can do the work as you go. It just, it's kind of helpful just to calculate quickly off to the side. So three squared plus one, this would be 10, right? And then F of five, so five squared and then plus one, that would give us what, 26 here? And so then when we go to calculate the average rate of change, right? Just being a little lazy with my notation there, uh, we would have f of 5 minus f of 3, and then all over 5 minus 3. So that's that new way to kind of show it. So it would be 26 minus 3, and then all over 5 minus 3. That's going to give me, oh, just kidding. f of 3 was 10. Ooh, this is where I have my whiteout at home with me. See, sometimes it prepped and ready. All right, that should be a 10. This will give me 16 over 2, and it comes out to be 8. Now, what does that mean visually? Well, think about this graph. You know what x squared looks like. That's a plain old parabola. The plus one would shift it up one unit because we just finished talking about our transformations unit, right? And so it would shift up so that it would cross at one and it would look something like this. So what I was asking you guys was what is the average rate of change or what is the slope between where three and five are? So over here at three, what you calculated was this would be the point 310. Right? And then at 5, this would be the point 5 and then 26. So it's not the most accurate looking graph, but that's okay. If we were to connect the dots between those two points, so I'm going to grab my straight edge here because I happen to have it. That would be the little line between them. It's a little tough to see because mine isn't perfectly drawn. Right? But what we just calculated, that 8, that is the slope of the segment that connects those two points right there. That's really what you're actually calculating. Right? So visually you should look at it and be like, yeah, that's a pretty steep segment. A slope of eight should hopefully make sense there. Right? So with that being said, when it's linear, we said it's always the slope, right? Whereas in this case, depending on the interval, the rate could possibly change. So the interval here, it made sense that it was positive. 
if the interval was maybe somewhere from like here to here, then I would have a rate that's negative because I would have a negative slant over here, all right? So I'm gonna say for non-linear functions, the average rate of change can vary, or maybe I'll just say varies, depending on the domain interval. So it could be positive in one place, negative in another. All right, when you flip it on over, there's a question that's sort of set up for us. It's the only thing on that page. So when you flip on over to that next page here, it says the table represents a linear function. Find the missing values. So the fact that you're told right off the bat that it's a linear function, what that should mean to you at this point is that there is then going to be a constant rate of change or a constant slope. Mm -hmm. So you're giving it to you this way. You could also look at, you know, a normal table of values that way. It doesn't actually matter. Right? There's a couple different ways to do this. We're going to talk about linear regressions. We would be able to take advantage of that once we, re you know, review those. Um, but something to keep in mind is if you calculate the slope between any two points, it would need to remain that way for the rest of them. So I'm going to do that. If I calculate the slope, remember, change in y over change in x. So the only two points that you know all the values of are right here. So here's an xy point, here's an xy point. So if I do the change in the y values, so negative five, negative one, so I'm gonna go one minus negative five. So you can think of it as y2 minus y1. And then change in x's, so five minus one, this would give me six and then over four, and so that is the slope of this line, all right? There's my slope. So if I need it to stay consistent, that means for every three it's going up, it's going over two. Now, could you do this by just kind of filling in the values and like walking on a graph? Absolutely, all right? So you could graph it to see it visually, or I can kind of put in just all right, a Y here. So what I know is I have some point 11 comma y, and I have these two other points to play with. So remember, this is the point one negative five, this is the point five one. So now that I know what the slope is, I could actually work backwards from that. So I'm not gonna fully finish this, but I can give you an idea of what I mean by that. So if I use the point, let's use the five one, so we can avoid the negatives. And then I'm gonna take my other point that I'm working with, which is 11 comma something, all right? The slope, should be three halves because it's linear. So it's gonna stay three halves no matter what. So let's actually calculate the slope using these two points. So the slope would be the change in y's. So y2, oops, I don't need the two there though. Sorry, I said it, but I didn't need to write it. So y2 minus y1, which would be y minus one, and then over the change in the x's here. So 11 minus five. So this would give me y minus one over six, has to come out to equal three halves, right? This is a little equation I've now set up for myself. Cross multiplication will get the job done. So if we cross multiply here, I do two times y minus one, six times three will give me 18. I have a choice, I can distribute that too, I could divide it out. Lots of ways that we could finish this problem. So if I add the two on over, this will give me two y equals 20, and y should come out to be 10. All right, now with that being said, that means back in my chart, I'm gonna slide back up here. Right. What I can do is I could then kind of graph these and see like, is this making sense? So I don't have graph paper sitting next to me, but I can still give myself like a reasonable graph to kind of look at. So I'm gonna slide back up so you can see what I'm writing here. So one point was one negative five. So over at one, be down at negative five. And then the next point was um, 5, 1, so kind of over to 5 and up to 1. So even without a perfect scale, it should be looking something like this. So then my last point that we just said we should have is the point 11, so up here, 
and then up to 10. Now, would I be able to perfectly tell like, oh, of course I did it right? No, not perfectly. But if you were on graph paper, yes, you could. So don't underestimate literally plotting some points and using that visual to help you.